kids outside start screaming. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, it sounds like there's some children screaming outside my window. So <laughs> they're, they're having fun, I promise. They're not being tortured. They're wild children living in Mexico, which I think seems like a great time. <laughs> Um, for everyone who's watching, um, I am going to try to keep an eye on the live chat, but I usually can't really keep up with it and focus on the task at hand, which is today an interview with Jennifer Lull. So if you want to ask a question, please, please do that. Um, but use, if you're able to use the, um, super chat so that I see it. Um, but yeah, I, I will try to keep a bit of an eye on the live chat. And um, of course, I am here with Jennifer Lull, who is, hi Shelby, hi Hugo, hi everyone, hi Lucy. Um, <laughs> Jennifer is the founder and president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture, CBC. And so much of her work, I've, I've known Jennifer for some time. I think the first time we ever did an interview was like in 2015 or something crazy like that. I just realized that and I was like, whoa. Um, but much of her work has been focused on raising awareness around the ethical problems and harms of big fertility and in particular the surrogacy industry. Um, and she was also a pediatric critical care nurse for many years. Um, she's produced tons of documentaries. They're all available on the Center for Bioethics and Culture website. Um, uh, there's one called Exploitation. There's one called Big Fertility. Most recently, she did a documentary called The Detransition Diaries, which hopefully we'll get to talk about in another conversation episode. Um, we won't be focusing on that today, but and I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I keep hearing amazing things about it, so I'm really excited to see it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, Jennifer. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. You know, I read your article that kind of, um, was the, the impetus for us being here today on, you know, women can't have it all. And it made me recall, I don't know, probably 10 years ago now I was on the Dr. Oz show and, and the topic was, when is it too old to have a baby? So we're still kind of having that conversation. Yeah. And it's a it's a really it's a really interesting conversation. It's really really divisive and controversial, though. And in my lifetime as a feminist, I've gone in all sorts of different circles around this question, um, including you know rejecting the idea that like you you have to have babies in your twenties and you get to a point where you're too old and. Um, I've, I've really only started to learn about, I guess, the reproductive technology industry um, fairly recently. And, and learning about it and, and talking to people like you and people like Mary Lou Singleton, for example, I've learned a lot from her also, um, has made me really angry about what women are told about their reproductive capacity and you know what they can do to resolve nature's challenges in that regard. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit about you know when did you when did you first start doing this work? You know what sort of made you focus really heavily on things like surrogacy and then you know and IVF and and things like that. Yeah. Well, a couple of things was when I before I went back to graduate school and I was doing clinical nursing in predominantly university hospitals in pediatrics, you know, we saw all the IVF babies in the hospital. So kind of already then I was kind of like going, wow, this is kind of, you know, interesting. You know, why are all these kids that are basically made as science lab projects, you know, ending up in the hospital. And so that was kind of in the back of my mind. And then when I finished graduate school, that was at the height of sort of the huge, like, embryonic stem cell human cloning debate. And I live in California where we passed a, you know, many billion dollar bond initiative to advance that research. And me and sort of a handful of feminists in the, Cal in the California area kind of here, were saying, well, where are you gonna get all the eggs from? And because in order to advance a huge scientific 
enterprise that's going to develop all these amazing, wonderful cures. And I'm all for cures um, for sick people. Um, you know, I was one of, you know, probably a dozen women in the state of California that were just raising that question. And when I started raising that question and writing and speaking out about where all the eggs going to come from, that's when the women who sold their eggs found me. Because all along they were told, well, it must have been something you did. Oh, we don't ever see this happen for you. It sucks to be you. Um, and and so through that, that sort of put me into the stepping stone of filmmaking. And that's when I made exploitation. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a bit, little bit about the process of of IVF and and what women go through? Yeah, real quick. Um, it's it's kind of um, well. First, it's all the bar the sexy marketing and recruiting. You know, the making sure that you fit the profile. You know, you cross all the. I'm pretty. I'm smart. I'm tall. I don't have any genetic defects. I don't have any bad medical history, and I need the money. So there's all this slick marketing. Then once you're accepted, and you're one of the chosen ones. Um, you know, you're put on, and this is re relevant to the trans debate. You know. Uh, egg donors are put on Lupron, and we know that kids are put on Lupron to block their puberty. So the first drug an egg donor takes is she's put on Lupron, and that causes like a medical menopause. It puts your ovaries to sleep. And then she's put on a different regime of fertility drugs to super ovulate her, because if you're going to pay her 10 grand, you don't want one egg. And, you know, we, they, you know, put her ovaries into hyperdrive, so she produces lots and lots of eggs, and then they go in and they, and they surgically remove them. So in the short term of that process, like two women in exploitation had stroke. And the FDA just issued a new warning last month on kids put on Lupron for puberty blocker that it causes increased pressure in the brain. Well, so you can imagine, well, ha, stroke. So there's all these short-term risks. You know, one woman had a torsioned ovary because of all the swelling. So her, her fallopian tube got kinked like a garden hose. And her ovary got no blood supply for days until they finally picked it up and she had to be rushed back into the hospital for you know emergency surgery to have her dead ovary removed so there's all those short-term kind of complications and then the longer term which we don't really know so much um except for the cancer link so my colleagues and i actually have published in the medical literature a case report of otherwise healthy egg donors who went on as young women and developed breast cancer Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're screened out. They don't pick you to be a, an egg donor if you have a history of breast cancer. Nobody's going to pick you. So these are already women who say, I have no medical history, no family history, nothing. So it's sort of a, hmm. But we know because we've done research on infertile women that there are cancer risks associated with the drugs. We've just never done research on healthy women who take higher, higher doses of those drugs and the, and the risks of the, to those women. And, and these women are taking these drugs to produce eggs to be purchased by women who are infertile? Or gay men. Gay men, okay. always, gay men always buy eggs. Or the scientific researchers still want eggs. Because the bench scientists that are doing embryo research and trying to study, you know, whatever they're studying, you know, scientists are studying all kinds of diseases. So a lot of times extra eggs will go to scientific research. Mm -hmm. So either so, infertile couples, gay, gay men, or researchers, kind of the three big categories. Right. And I mean, are women warned, you know, these women who are going to sell their eggs um, and therefore are going these through these processes, are they given any kind of warning about the impact that these hormones um, like Lupron, for example, will have on them and that there is a potential heightened risk, risk of, of cancer? Yeah, well, in the United States, there isn't any standardized um, informed consent. So it really does vary clinic to clinic. And so you can imagine the sketchier the clinic is and the sketchier the informed consent is. Um, maybe more reputable agencies might be a little bit more forthright. My experience is even if you're being honest, they're downplayed. We just have to tell you this. You mm -hmm. know, it's like when you read any kind of warning pamphlet in any, any kind of drug, you know, they list every single possible thing, but it's more of a, we're just covering our bases here because we just have to tell you this. It's very rare. Um, that women are told honestly that we've never ever once studied you. We don't know what, what happens to this type of patient population. 
otherwise healthy women who have nothing wrong with their fertility. They're, if anything, they're told there's no known risk. So in your mind, you go, oh, there's no risk versus no, there's no known risk because we've never studied it. So we don't know if there's any risk. So it's sort of a sleight of hand in the language. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's like really started to make me angry lately, again, as I've learned more about this, is this idea of freezing eggs. Um, you know, like I've had friends, you know, I'm, I'm 42 now. It's like, how old am I? So, you know, within the past, I don't know, few years, I've had friends who've talked about freezing their eggs because they haven't had kids yet. Like maybe they haven't met a partner yet um, who they want to or can have kids with, but they still have this idea in their head where either they, they do want to be moms or they still don't know. And they're like, well, I might. So, you know, keep, put these away for later just in case. And, you know, the reality is that I think that egg freezing is viewed as and sold as like a guarantee. Um, I One of the things that spurred me, there was a couple of things, but one of the things that spurred me to write um, my piece on Substack about this issue is that I read an interview with Whitney Cummings, who's a comedian, mm -hmm. and I think she's about 40, and she said she froze her eggs and that it was really empowering for her and that she viewed it as like an insurance policy. She was like, now I don't feel so stressed. And like, if I'm like dating a guy, I don't feel like rushed to, you know, settle. Like I don't feel rushed to settle down. Like now I have lots of time. I can have a baby at 45 if I want to. Um, and I was like, like, I was like, I don't think this is a good way to go into this. And I don't even think that's true. And I know, you know, I know that freezing your eggs is a really expensive process. And I don't think it actually is a guarantee. Um, but I want you to talk a bit more about that, like how egg freezing works to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I actually live in the but I like to say the backyard of the Silicon Valley where all the high tech companies offer this as a, as a benefit to female employees. You know, they want to keep women in the workforce working away and grinding it out. So they offer to cover, you know, provide that egg banking and freezing service. But um, first, what, it's still very experimental, right? When, when they first started this, you know, save, you know, save your eggs, bank them, freeze them for later. Um, you know, it wasn't until a few years later that they went, oh, we found an even better process, you know, a better way because, you know, the, you know, the end game is right. It's all about success, right? The end game is you'll be happy and you'll get that baby that you finally want whenever you want it. Um, but, you know, in fact, you know, eggs are really hard to freeze because they're very, very liquid. They're mostly water. Embryos actually freeze better than eggs do. Um, and so part of the technique is trying to master, you know, freezing eggs and getting them to survive once you thaw them, because you eventually have to thaw them to use them. And when something is mostly water and you freeze it and then you thaw it out, it kind of wants to sort of disintegrate. Um, so, you know, and, and the verdict is still out on the success because, um, again, because embryo, I mean, eggs don't like to be frozen and you lose a lot. Uh, and, you know, it's uncertain yet, you know, there was just a couple of studies that I posted recently that show like babies born of frozen embryos have higher rates of cancer, but we haven't yet studied, well, okay, does that mean babies born of frozen eggs that then we use and thaw out to make embryos? How do those kids fare? So it's, a, it's still very ex experimental. And like you say, it's, it's expensive. You know, if you're a low income woman who's, you know, cleaning people's houses and you're like, well, I'm never going to be able to stop cleaning houses, maybe I'll freeze my eggs for when I'm 40 or 50, and then I can finally stop cleaning people's toilets. Um, you know, that's not a service that's available to people that are, are impoverished. And I think that should concern us as women, just looking out for our, our low income sisters. Sure. And I mean, is there, what's, what's when a woman's going to freeze her eggs, how does that work? Like, I mean, what's the, like, what's the medical process like? Does she need to take any hormones to do that? 
for she example. Does the, same, the same regime that an egg donor would. Now, the mm -hmm. only caveat is they might not as aggressively stimulate her because in the egg donor, it, they're happy as clams if they can get an egg donor to give them 60 eggs. Now, if you're just freezing and banking your own eggs for your own children, you might be happy knowing I've got maybe 10 to work with if and when I ever decide to have children, which, and, and that is done because she's put on lesser doses, less strong, you know, big gun. So maybe the risk might be a little bit less, but she's not taking such high powerful doses. But again, we don't know because we're just learning as we go. We're just doing this. I just broke, busted out my Gina Korea book, The Mother Machine. Got to get it in camera. And I'm actually interviewing Gina next week, Gina next week, because she's just been a hero of mine. But you know, the whole premise of her, her view of assisted reproductive technology is that women, we're just guinea pigs. Mm. You know, they're, they're making money. They're, they're advancing technologies and techniques um, and an industry um, just experimenting on our bodies. And on, on one hand, we're kind of willingly going along with it because we're either, you know, believing the lie that, you know, women can have it all. We can have our babies whenever we want. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to be, you know, just more women, more ill health in women's bodies, you know, more cancers, uh, more, more problems with um, our, our fertility. It's interesting. Lucy's pointed this out in the content, in the, in the comments here. She says, it's a mystery to me how USA companies will fund egg freezing rather than pay maternity leave. And I also didn't know that in the U.S., like employers were paying for this. Like I just understood it to be an enormous cost. Like as I understand it to freeze your eggs costs like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Yeah. And you have to pay a monthly storage fee for as long as you keep, you know, freezing your eggs. Now I'm not saying all companies pay for that, but I know a lot of them in, in the Silicon Valley do. I think Facebook pays for it. I think LinkedIn pays for it. I think Apple might. Hmm. Um, I, I don't think that Google has bought in on, on it yet, but that could have changed. I'm, I'm not, I don't follow every single day what all their employee benefits are. Um, but yeah, you're right. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's like these Silicon Valley big tech companies are paying women to freeze their eggs? Is it just to keep them working, as you said, yeah. or is there something else there? Yeah. Well, I think it's the mindset, even, even for men, you know, I mean, I actually spoke at Google once they have the, they have their equivalent of Ted talks. They just call them Google talks. And I gave a talk down there and it's like, they do everything possible to make you not need to go home. Mm -hmm. You know, you get your hair cut, you can get your laundry done. You know, you, you, you can go swimming in the swimming pools that they have on the campus. It's like, you know, and one of the people that was giving me a tour before my talk said, you know, if they're on a deadline for a big product that they're rolling out, they basically will bring in cots so that you can sleep at work so that you don't have to waste time getting home and coming back. So I, I think that's just sort of the ethos in general. But yeah, for women in particular, why would we want, you know, to pay you to take six months off and to sit at home when we can offer you I would say egg freezing and banking is cheaper than paid maternity leave, you know, because it might be a thousand dollars a month versus they're paying you your salary for every single month that you're not working. So they mm -hmm. might see it as sort of a cost benefit, you know, exchange. Right. And say you do, you you do manage to freeze some eggs. You get to be 45, 46, 47. You decide that you're ready to have a baby. I mean, how, likely is it that you will actually be able to do that yeah now that is the wrinkle isn't it because we've set it all up that you have your insurance card you can whenever you're ready you can ignore the biological clock and you know that's one thing that hasn't changed we know that as we age as women even if we naturally get pregnant and i'm not saying women in their 40s can't naturally get pregnant that still does happen not as often, um, but you're still in a higher risk category because you're older. And, and, and when you're in a higher risk category, if you are pregnant, your baby is at risk because when the mother is at risk, the baby's at risk too. So you've got a mother, you know, so you'll see all these pregnant women in high risk maternity hospitals 
where they might have to spend, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks in the hospital before they're even due, or there's a high rate of miscarriage. And one of the things that Dr. Oz showed on the screen when I was in studio for that program on how old is too old to have a baby, he had a big infograph graphic on the wall that showed um, a baby in utero, a fetus in utero, and it pulling and ripping away from the lining of the uterus and the massive hemorrhage because the uterus is a, is a muscle. And I know you lift weights, Megan. I lift weights. Yeah. But you cannot go to the gym and exercise your uterus. Hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a muscle that just ages because we get old, but there's no kegels or dumbbells or squats or anything. And so the uterus being this big muscle just gets old. And as that, as that fetus develops and gets bigger and bigger and heavier, it pulls on that muscle. And that's why you'll see these, you know, these miscarriage rates. And, you know, as much as I take a whack at big fertility, um, I think about 10 years ago, I tried to get, you know, my friend, a colleague of mine, who's an OBGYN doctor actually told me about this. And I said, please send me, send me that data again. But it was American Society of Reproductive Medicine um, who put out kind of a lot of educational information about the biological clock. And, you know, if you really do want to have children, you need to be mindful of the realities of your body. Mm -hmm. And it was feminist groups that came out and smacked them down. Yeah. You know, how dare you tell women when they have to have their children? How dare you tell women about their body? How dare you? How dare you? And I kind of thought, well, that's, that's kind of unfortunate because at, back then they were probably just trying to be wise doctors in better informing women um, that, you know, we get old and that's part of evolution. You know, you can't have kids. You can't have kids because you're kid, you're little. And then you go into puberty and you become able to have kids. So, you know, we can, we can evolve and carry on. And then you go through menopause because you're getting ready to be old and die. So your, your purpose is, you know, but they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that, you know, that age matters. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate thing because I mean, I don't like to play into cliches in general and I definitely don't like to play into anti-feminist cliches in general, but it does seem to be an area where feminism has gone too far in a way in telling women that they can choose anything and no one can tell them no, no one can tell them they can't do that. If they can choose it, you know, that's great. And that's empowering. And women really can have it all. They don't have to get married. They don't have to have babies or they can wait indefinitely to do that. They can make all their choices. They can do exactly what they want. And I think that would be great. And to be honest, much of what I've done in my life has been what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to feminism, uh, if it had to get married or have babies, um, yeah. but it's not true, you know. Like you, you still are beholden to nature, and I think that it's a like we've it's a broader problem in society where we've started to believe that we as humans can tackle nature. Like it's as if we don't see ourselves as part of nature anymore. Yeah, and I think we have to realize that. You know, some of this, yeah, sure, you, you know, if you're raising young girls or whatever, you know, you, you know, if you want to aspire to be president of the United States, if you want to, you know, you know, be a Hollywood actress, if you want to be a stay at home mom, you know, you can do all of those things. But when it comes to science and, you know, biological reality, it's like, you, you can smoke, you'll never get cancer, said nobody. <laughs> but we tell people, you can, you can have your children whenever you want. Well, that's not true. And that's not a judgment statement. That's not, uh, you know, a pro-feminist or an anti-feminist statement. That's just a biological reality of how your body works. You know, it's like if you break your legs, you can't just say, well, just get up and walk. You can just do it. No, no you can't. You have to wait till your, your leg heals. But um, so I, I, I was happy to hear that because, like I said, I love to beat up on the fertility um, because they over, overwhelmingly in my eyes, they act really bad. In, in the, you know, in the space of women's health. But, you know, to, to their credit, you know, way back when they tried to kind of to speak truth into reality. Yeah. When, I mean, is there a time that is ideal for women to reproduce? Well, I mean, that's the beauty of our bodies. You know, there's not really, oh, 
you know, when, when do girls go through puberty? Well, that's a wide range, right? When do women en enter menopause? That's a wide range. So there's no real like normal, like I can't say everybody should have their children by 22. You know, we do know that, you know, if you just chart the graphs, you know, when we enter puberty, we become fertile, we start ovulating and having our monthly cycles. And then our eggs kind of do this kind of dive, you know, as we're slowly entering into menopause. And that in that kind of rise and fall is, is different for all women. I mean, you can have your doctor check and, and to see if you're, up, you know, premenopausal, perimenopausal or, or, or where you are on that. Um, so I don't want to be pinned down to like a time. But I do think when you look at older women, even those who get pregnant naturally, you know, it's late 30s, early 40s when you will sometimes be put into that high risk category in your pregnancy um, just because of age. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you see any ethical issues around telling women and enabling via technology women to have babies later in life, you know, in their mid 40s or late 40s, for example. Do I'm sorry, do I see that? Any ethical, ethical issues? Well, I think the ethics is, are we being truthful versus mm -hmm. selling a false hope? I mean, if you're, if you're selling a false hope, I don't think that's ethical, because especially if you know, you know, you're telling women you can have it all. I think that that is unethical. Um, I do, I do think that the, the monetary aspects of it is an ethical question. Is it okay for us more wealthy or the wealthy or the rich to be able to have access to things that the poor don't have access to? Um, I'm not making a case that we should enable the poor to have access to this because I'm not really a big fan of assisted reproductive technology because mm -hmm. it is risky. Um, you know, Gilda Radner was an infertile woman, and most people don't know that about her. And she and Gene Wilder, when she was married um, to him before she died of ovarian cancer, went through six rounds of IVF and was never successful in being able to conceive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are women fully informed of the short and the long-term risk? Are they fully informed of what we're just now learning that children born this way may have problems, higher risk of certain kinds of cancers? Two genetic diseases, one I can't remember the name of it, one's Beck with Wenneman syndrome, seem to be higher, more prevalent in children born through assisted reproductive technology. Obesity, we're now, because we've been making babies in the lab for so long now that we are starting to get more and more sample sizes and following children over a longer period of time as they as they grow up. Um, so we're, you know, it's not without, it's not, you know, a piece of cake. And it's mm -hmm. an expensive piece of cake, it still overwhelmingly fails. Most mm -hmm. IVF cycles fail. The mm -hmm. majority of IVF cycles fail. That's good information to know, especially considering how costly it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, I just want to remind people who are just tuning in now that um, please ask questions. If you have questions for Jennifer, ask them in the live chat. Um, I can't keep track of everything that's happening in the live chat. So if you do have an important question that you want me to see, please use the super chat. Um, I, if I could just add one more comment on uh -huh. that is I'm, I'm pretty sure the national health system in the United Kingdom for women who are a particular age, and I don't know what that is, but older women, they get one cycle um, using, you know, the, the the money of the the good people in the United Kingdom. Why? Because they're older women, and it's and the success rate is is pretty horrible. So they're not willing to spend a lot of their you know national health dollars on a, a, an enterprise that overwhelmingly fails. Is there a cutoff age for women, you know, for clinics that are, are freezing women's eggs and then and going through IVF? Is there a cutoff? Well, um, in, in the, US, cutoff would be, the, the cutoff for egg freezing is you just don't have the eggs left because you're, you know, you're too old. So that would be sort of a, you know, naturally assigned cutoff depending on the woman. Um, as far as IVF, I don't know of any cutoff age. I mean, I think in the United States, any fertility clinic would be happy to take your money, even when they know that the chance of success is infinitesimal. So, 
Shelby in the live chat asks, are these women who freeze their eggs doing IVF after fully completing menopause? That seems horribly unnaturally and unfair to mother and baby. Oh, they could. I mean, you, you've probably seen the news um, stories where you'll see the grandmothers carrying the grandchild. I mean, like recently there was a, a gay couple and one of the men in the couple, his mother was carrying the baby for he and his partner. And she was clearly a postmenopausal woman. Um, so if you're a, a woman who say froze and banked your eggs at 32, and by the time you were 45, you decided now I'm ready to have that baby, you could well, you know, be, you know, approaching menopause or in menopause. Um, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's still, but it's going to be a high risk pregnancy because of your age, the older you are. Now, maybe these women opt to use a surrogate, right? Because they do get to be 45 when they finally decide they want to have that baby or Mr. Wright's come along or whatever. They might just outsource the pregnancy. Right. And of course, that was another issue that I wanted to discuss with you. I mean, we recently saw pictures online everywhere of Khloe Kardashian. The Kardashians apparently are a big fan of surrogacy. I think Kim had two babies via surrogacy or bought two babies via surrogacy, I suppose we could say. Um, and Khloe, I watched the Kardashians. Like I've watched every single season since the beginning and I, uh, I have a love hate relationship with them. Like I'm sure many, many, many other people do, but I, like, I watch the show pretty religiously. I'm always like excited. I'm like the new one's out. So I watched the first episode of their like recent season that just started. And I was so angry because it, the whole episode was so creepy. So it was mostly focused on Chloe having a baby, in quotations, via a surrogate. And the family was treating it as though Chloe was pregnant. They talked about her pregnancy, as in Chloe's pregnancy, and she's having a baby. And Chloe's announcing to people that I'm having a baby. And I was like, You're not having a baby. You are not having a pregnancy. I found it so disgusting. And then the surrogate, who's completely um, invisible, of course, she doesn't exist at all. She's not a full human being, not like Chloe Kardashian because she's rich. Um, they 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 have all these photos online of Chloe in a hospital bed yeah. with this new baby, as if she gave birth to this baby, which she did. Yeah, Pete Buttigieg and his husband did that too after they got their twins. You know, the two of them were all squished in a hospital bed, each holding a baby, you know, it's like, and everybody was giving them congratulations and all that. And I'm like, but yeah, I, I mean, I follow a lot of the surrogacy people on Instagram and, you know, you'll see the non-pregnant woman at her baby shower being showered with gifts, you know, and throwing the baby shower for her and, you know, and then, you know, of course, you know, it's appalling that in the United States we have horrible maternity leave. Um, but we give paternity leave to, or, or maternity leave to people who didn't even have the baby, you know, they get six weeks of paid time off, which is, you know, I, I had children in the state of California. I got six weeks of maternity leave. And that was it. I could take more time off if I wanted, but it was without pay. But now they will give six weeks maternity leave to a woman who hired a surrogate to have her baby. And you're like, well, why don't you give the woman who had the baby 12 weeks <laughs> instead of she gets six weeks and you get six weeks. But it's insane. It's insane that she's not having a baby, Chloe. No. And I mean, I just, I, I, th I find it so, I guess it makes sense because of the money factor, but I find it really maddening that it's celebrities who are promoting these reproductive technologies. And, you know, really surrogacy is so much about very, very, very privileged people who either just don't want to deal with going through the process of being pregnant or getting pregnant or giving birth and so on and so forth and want to farm it off to someone else, or they can't, you know, either because they have issues with fertility um, or because they're men <laughs> and men can't get pregnant and give birth. Yeah. And there's a new lawsuit just filed 
last week, I think, in New York State by two gay men because um, you know New York State insurance doesn't provide these benefits to gay men. And so they were filing a lawsuit because it's their right to to access these benefits and they're being discriminated against. And it's it's insane that, you know, and then okay, well, if you claim it's a right, then of course we all have to pay for it or you know, go go to jail for denying you your rights. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean for it has become an issue of of gay rights, it seems. Um, and that whole question to me is really troubling because I have always felt that it's not a right to have a baby. Um, but any, but even women think that. Like it's particularly weird for men to believe that they have a right to a baby. But I like I also get it in some ways because people are like, oh well, gay men have the right to marry, they have the right to love, they should have the right to start a family just like anyone else. But anyone else doesn't necessarily, I mean, we know heterosexual couples that can't have babies because, you know, there's something wrong with their bodies. Well, there's nothing wrong with two gay men's bodies except for they just don't have all the parts that are needed to, to make a baby. So I just, I reject that, I'm with you. Nobody has a right to, you know, if you give birth to a child that's yours, you know, you have a right to that child. The state can't come in and take your child away and say, well, we're gonna give it to these really nice gay people over here because they can't have a baby. And you, know, you don't have a right to your own child. But yeah, you don't have a, I would say you don't have a right to another person's body so that you can have a child. Um, and there I are just, who, who I know as surrogates only will do surrogacy for gay men because they're so sympathetic. Oh, they'd be such good dads and, and, and they can't have a baby. So I'm, I'm, I will intentionally tell my agency, I would like to be a surrogate for a gay couple. Um, sometimes women are a little too compassionate for their own good. Eh? <laughs> you know, sorry I mean, for these really, really uber rich, wealthy gay men. I think in the United States, the gay men are the highest in the, the demographic with wealth. Interesting. You know, economically, they're the, the most wealthy of a demographic. And I think lesbians are kind of toward the bottom. Um, I just noticed, I just was like checking to see if the super chat worked. And I'm not sure if it does, because I just noticed that YouTube demonetized this video before it even started. <laughs> Why? Because apparently it's too controversial to question yeah. reproductive technologies. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just like I just looked over and I'm it was sorry. like limited, and I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it's so funny because sorry, I'm not trying to completely change the subject, but no, no. my videos are demonetized pretty regularly. Um, and I noticed that like Matt Taibbi the other day made this huge big deal because one of their YouTube videos was demonetized and this is YouTube censorship. And I was like, oh, am I supposed to be making a big deal out of that? Because I just thought that was normal because like half of my videos are demonetized. No, I mean, it's really controversial. So I don't know, but my point is that, sorry. Our film that we released last year has had like over 103,000 watches and we've made $11 because YouTube has demonetized. Demonetize that. <laughs> Which one has that? It's, it's called Transmission. What's the rush to reassign right. gender? Okay. Twelve dollars. I think it's like eleven dollars and eighty cents or something. It's a joke. And yeah. then, you know, I have this one troll that says I just do this for the money. <laughs> like, oh yeah. 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 I know. People have accused me of doing this for the money also. And I was like, such a I wish. Such a grifter. <laughs> Yeah. But in any case, so I actually don't know if that means that the super chat has been shut off too, or if it works. Oh, so if anybody can well, tell, yeah. let me know. But other, I mean, I'll try to keep it on in the live chat so that people can ask questions if the <laughs> super chat's not working. Um, I mean, I guess I, I wonder, there's a number of questions I have about the harms of surrogacy. But one of those questions is about, because I keep thinking about the mothers, you know, like the women who give birth to these babies. And in this episode of the Kardashians, um, Kim is explaining to Chloe what the process is. And sh Kim said that when this surrogate gave birth, the baby, like she gave birth and she said, the baby came on my chest, which is a strange way of phrasing it, but I'm assuming that means that Kim got to catch the baby and then immediately take the baby from the mother. And I was just like, that must be such a 
crazy feeling for the mother. Yeah. Well, part of it, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer in promoting people's books. You maybe you read Ky- Kaisha Ekman's book on split self pro- prostitution and surrogacy mm-hmm. and the split self. And when you look at how when a w- woman signs up to be a surrogate, she's instantly groomed. You never say they're pregnant. They're on a journey. You know, they'll say things like, you know, their bun, my oven. I'm just helping to build a family, you know, so they're already, you know, they're told the language to use. They're told to sort of disassociate from their body, right? Sort of like in prostitution, I'm just doing this sex work. and I have to separate from this thing that I'm doing so that I can keep my, my insanity uh, at bay and, you know, have some kind of respect for myself. So that's, that's, that's a big thing. And the reality is, is women do, you know, our own research. I know you were, had Callie Fell had, had you on her Venus Rising podcast. And this several, just a few months back, we finally got our peer reviewed research on surrogates pre, um, published in uh, uh, Donna Hughes's journal, Dignity. And what we found is that surrogate mothers in our, our research reported more postpartum depression with their surrogate pregnancies than with their own pregnancies. And that was an interesting finding that we weren't expecting. It was a question that we included in our, our survey when we went to, you know, through the IRB process. Um, but yeah, there, it was just pretty heartbreaking. And, and also in some of their self-reporting and interviewing them, their own children, because, you know, little children, if they know that their mother's pregnant, you know, they're excited and no baby's coming. Maybe we're going to have a brother or sister or something like that. And, you know, a couple of surrogates just recounted how sad it was for their children because oftentimes surrogates are told you can stay in the picture. You know, we'll keep updated. We'll invite you to the birthday parties. We'll send pictures and all that. Um, and in fact, they're usually just sort of erased. You know, you're not needed anymore. And that, you know, a couple of the surrogates reported that that was really hard for their children because they never got to see the baby that mom carried. I mean, she just came home, you know, you know, kind of you know, postpartum depression and no baby. Do we know anything about, you know, either just in your experience in talking to people or studies? I don't know if studies have been done on this around um, the impacts on the baby who's taken away from the mother and given to another woman who is then the baby's mother, I suppose. I don't even know what language to use around this, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, we have, that's an area where it's really understudied. Part of it's because this is still sort of new. Um, it's only in the last maybe 10 years become kind of in vogue. And it, you know, it used to be surrogacy was practiced, but it was more kind of hush hush and people weren't out there on the cover of People Magazine bragging about it. Um, so I think it's an unfolding story. There was one study that Susan Gollumbach did several years back now in, and she's a researcher in the United Kingdom. And she reported in her study on kids that were born of egg or sperm donation or surrogacy. And she reported in her research that around age eight, children born of surrogacy sort of, sort of exhibited signs of trouble and distress. I don't know of any newer study that's been done. Um, and I think it's, I think it's similar to adoption in that, you know, in the olden days, adoption was very hush hush. You were told, don't tell your child they were adopted, you know, keep it a secret, you know, and then, and then we learned that there was, there was this trauma between a, a child given up to, for adoption and, and the birth mother. And Nancy Verrier, who was in one of my films, wrote a great book called The Primal Womb. And, and it looked at children of adoption and how that mother and that baby have that imprinting womb from that immediate separation. And so I think we'll see similar things in surrogate born children. Um, but the problem is, is we have to keep harming them to get the sample size and to follow them over years to find out we really screwed them up. You know? It's like, it's not a win-win situation, right? You're like, God, yeah, let's just keep doing it so we can then find out that, yeah, this is really bad for them. Right. And I mean, how much do you know about the mental health impacts on the women, like the surrogates? Yeah, a lot of them have postpartum depression. You know, a a lot of them, the surrogates I know have absolutely diagnosed on, you know, clinical diagnoses on medication for PTSD. And it's, it's a strain on relationships. 
I mean, I, I talked to one surrogate, her, you know, her marriage disintegrated and her husband just felt inadequate because his wife basically had to rent out a room to, you know, for them to keep their, you know, roof over their head, you know, and when your, your wife can't do certain things because she's carrying a baby for, you know, these rich guys over here, you know, there's kind of a, just a, a, a bitterness and a resentment and, you know, just, you know, feeling like, why, why do we have to do this just to, you know, economically eat by? Yeah. I, and actually, yeah, someone in the comments, World Peace 21 is asking, how much do the surrogates get paid? And I know this differs from place to place because a lot, like from country to country, there's different laws around yeah. surrogacy. But let's talk about the U.S. first. Yeah, first we, what are the laws in the U.S. around surrogacy? And then how much are surrogates paid and what's what are they compensated with during the pregnancy well unlike your beloved canada which has a national law we have 50 states that have 50 different laws so basically you know you'd have to we have a state-by-state -state map on our website if anybody wanted to go and like what is the law in idaho or what's the law in florida um, and so it's really all over the map but um and, and the payment is all over the map because it's not regulated. You don't have a set fee that you, you have to pay or you can't charge above. In my state, California, surrogates start at a baseline of between thirty dollars and $40,000. That's a sort of a base fee. And then if they're willing to carry twins or triplets, they're paid an additional five grand. So if they carry an extra baby, it's another five grand. If they say, yeah, I'll carry triplets, that's 10 grand more. Um, then oftentimes we'll get, you know, just some kind of a monthly allowance, whether that be for maternity clothes or food, you know, for gas money to get to their doctor's appointments. You know, oftentimes they'll write into their contract that they get um, compensated extra if they have to go off work because, you know, the pregnancy requires them to go on bed rest. Then, they, then their salary can be compensated. Um, they might actually get compensated after the baby's born. So they have some payment in their postpartum period i've seen contracts where they even like you know for more generous kind-hearted baby buyers you know will pay for like cleaning service to come in if she had you know had to have a c-section to deliver their babies so she didn't have to clean her house so it really is but it, you know you can imagine that a surrogate in california is probably when you add all that up is maybe going to be getting 60 or seventy thousand dollars. and knowing that if this is a woman who's low income but she has a job she's doing her job and getting her salary and all this extra windfall. So this, it's a monetary incentive. You know, I don't have to quit my job as a barista at Starbucks and I can get this big lump sum of money. Is that kind of a negotiation between the surrogate and the woman or the man or the couple who's paying her to carry their baby? Does the monetary sum depend on what is offered kind of thing? It depends because some surrogates literally are, are surrogates for strangers. So they are, never even meet these people. You know, they're just sort of mapped through an agency, like a dating service. And, you know, they meet with a lawyer and the contract's all dra drafted. You know, some surrogates are much more savvy and much more able to advocate for themselves and say, this is what I want. Other surrogates who maybe aren't as confident or, you know, uh, well-versed, might just be grateful for whatever they're offered. I'm just here to help. I want to help somebody have a baby. Well, we're going to pay you 20 grand. Okay, that sounds great. So it really depends um, on on the agency, on the intended parents, on the surrogate. It's not a one size kind of fits all. I do not understand why somebody would want to help somebody else have a baby. But I mean, in that particular way. Yeah. I think that's very strange. Um, I mean, do you know, like, have you talked to many of these women who are doing, I guess it's called altruistic surrogacy. So they're not, are they not compensated at all? Well, it depends. I mean, you have altruistic surrogacy in Canada, but they are compensated and it's a sham what the, the language of the federal law in Canada, because surrogates can get all, you know, they can get all their pregnancy related expenses covered. Um, so you can pay their rent for the whole entire duration of the pregnancy. You can pay their grocery bill. You can pay their car payment. You could pay their cell phone bill because these are all pregnancy related expenses. 
So even the altruistic surrogates um, are, is a very small percentage. Now, the argument in New York State, because uh, Governor Cuomo, during the height of the COVID pandemic, he ran through a, a legalization of commercial surrogacy in New York State. Up until that point, New York, New York 100% permitted altruistic surrogacy. It was not illegal to have a woman to say, hey, I want to help you out. No, no money. Here's your baby. But the argument and the push from the senator there who had to come with his partner to California twice to buy women's eggs and buy eggs and move wombs said women aren't lining up to do it for free. You know, they, you know, surrogates overwhelmingly say, we're not doing this for the money. We're doing this to help. However, when you take the money out of it, they're not so interested in helping. Right. Um, Cyber Wanderlust in the comments says, does Jennifer know Cuba legalized surrogacy along with gay marriage just a few days ago? I did not know that. That's interesting. And it kind of goes hand in hand, right? First comes love, then comes marriage, and then comes the baby carriage. So it doesn't surprise me, but I was not aware of that recent, recent happening in Cuba. So what about places that have made surrogacy illegal like as i understand it places like india and thailand were kind of surrogacy hubs and you know a lot of wealthy western people would go to these poorer countries to find women to have their babies for them um is that still happening well if it is, it's happening on the black market, which, of course, you know, with anything with like prostitution or human trafficking, people are always worried about pushing it underground into the black market. Therefore, we need to make it legal and regulate it. Um, but, you know, you can look at countries like France. It's, this is illegal in France. It's illegal in Spain. It's illegal in Germany. So not just third world countries. Third world countries had it legalized and then they had to kind of walk it back. And I always remind people the reason why surrogacy, commercial surrogacy at an international level closed down in, in, in India was because women and children were being harmed. You know, women were being left destitute, children were being left abandoned if they were born not the way that they were, you know, they were ordered by the intended uh, parents. So, um, you know, the current laws in, in, in India is only Indian nationals can access surrogacy. Only Indian nationals can have a a member of their family do surrogacy for them. Only Indian nationals who are heterosexual and have five years of, of diagnosed infertility are able to access, um, you know, surrogacy. So, you know, I, I'm against surrogacy, so I'm not like, but I'm, ha I'm happy with movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've seen what happened when we closed it down, then it moved to U Ukraine. And that's been a total shitstorm since first COVID. Um, when all the babies were were stranded because of travel bans, and then now with war, babies are stranded, women are stranded. Um, right. I mean, if it were up to you, what what laws would you create around surrogacy? Well, they, you know, they would just kind of mirror our international laws around human trafficking. You know, because I do see this as a trafficking issue. When you look at the basis for the French law, um, you know the the. French law around surrogacy is framed as it is with slavery. Um, it's framed in the language of violence against women. You know, so I think there, there needs to be some kind of an international meeting of the minds where we just say that this is violence against women. This is trafficking in women and children's, you know, bodies and lives. Um, and nobody's going to die because they can't rent a womb and have a baby, you know. Right. I mean, it is, it's using a woman's body, body for something. And, and I mean, even if it is somebody who's doing it voluntarily or doing it for a family member out of the kindness of their own heart, it still seems unethical to me. But as I understand it, it's also dangerous. Like I think that there's a risk to the to the health of the, the surrogates or more than one risk, I suppose. Can you talk a little bit about those risks and the, the, yeah. the potential health hazards of doing this? 
Absolutely. And that was the basis of Callie and I's first approach into doing our research was to look at the health. And we already have two very good studies that have been done that show that a surrogate pregnancy is much higher risk. Um, what our study did, which I want to say has never been done before, you don't ever want to say never because then somebody finds, but I think it's never been done before, is what we compared the woman's own pregnancy with her own children with her surrogate pregnancy. So we've never had that comparison done. We just looked at women who were surrogates and went, oh, they have higher rates. So what we saw, higher rates of preeclampsia, higher rates of maternal hypertension, higher rates of gestational diabetes, higher rates of cesarean section, higher rates of postpartum depression. Um, overwhelmingly women of lower economic status, even if they were educated, they were still on the lower tiers of, you know, the U.S. economic uh, tier structure. Um, most of them, if they were partnered, their, their partner or husband was of like high school education or maybe an AA degree. So, you know, we saw the economic reality. But yeah, these are high risk pregnancies. Even when you compare, here's a woman who otherwise had healthy pregnancies with her own children, and then she became a surrogate. And oh my God, all these risks. Chronic health. We saw a lot more chronic health post surrogate pre pregnancy. So, problems that they never had before, but now that they had a surrogate pregnancy, they had a, these chronic health issues headaches. I can't remember, you know, there was about 10 or 15 of them that we asked them about. Um, you know, high blood pressure kind of issues. And um, one other thing, and I just forgot, it, maybe it'll come to me. But yeah, these are high risk pregnancies. So you're paying a woman to knowingly put herself at risk. And we've had three surrogates in California die. I think in the last couple of years, I reported about five to seven women in the US who have died of surrogacy related complications. Um, and one surrogate in Idaho, she was carrying twins for a couple in Spain, again, where all surrogacy is illegal, and she and the twins died. And she was one day away from a scheduled C-section. So it was a otherwise, you know, full-term uncomplicated pregnancy. And she was going to have a C-section probably because she was delivering twins. And these were going to be her like seventh babies, I think she'd given birth to. And in our research, we control because back to, you know, you can't exercise your uterus and get it in shape. We control for age and the number of pregnancies these women had, because we know as we age and we know as we have more and more babies, each pregnancy gets more high risk because of that age and because of the number of pregnancies. So we control for that. And we still found that the surrogate pregnancies were high risk. Have there been situations where a, a person or a couple hires a surrogate and the surrogate has the baby and then the people who paid her or hired her or made the contract or whatever decide they don't want the baby anymore? Probably. In, in my work, mostly what I hear is during the pregnancy, people change their mind and don't want the baby. Um, and that has happened quite often that I'm aware of. And, and the issues is either they found out there's something wrong with the baby or the couple is oftentimes splitting up. So, you know, you know, new rules apply today. We thought we wanted a baby. Now we don't. And those get into really ugly complications, especially for the surrogate because she's bound by contract. And, and I read a lot of surrogate contracts and most of the contracts I've read have been drawn up in California, which is a really liberal surrogacy state. Um, and overwhelmingly surrogate, contracts have language in it around termination clauses or reduction clauses, like in the case of being pregnant for triplets and the one surrogate in California, she was pregnant for triplets. And then the couple said, oh, we just want twins. We don't really want three babies. So she got into a little bit of a pickle um, over that. Um, but I, I'm sure it happens after the children are born, but I don't usually hear those stories because normally it's a surrogate who's in crisis during pregnancy when they kind of reach out and find me and, can you get me a lawyer? Yeah, I mean, that would be, a, I don't know what you would do in that situation. Yeah, one woman in California, she was expecting twins and all, all surrogacy is illegal in China. So the Chinese come like by the droves to California. And this was a very, very wealthy couple who had decided to terminate their marriage and they wanted her to terminate the pregnancy. And they were going to pay her $80,000 to terminate the pregnancy, in addition to what they were already paying her for the surrogacy. So they said, here's an extra $80,000 to, to terminate. And she said, my husband and I would happily keep these babies. 
Um, and the Chinese woman said to her, because this surrogate was not as was not wealthy like them, we don't want our children being raised in a home like yours, which was in, intended because of the economic realities of this couple. So it was like, you're okay to have our babies, but you're not okay to have them grow up in your home because of your economic status. So this surrogate told me that what happened, and then the ex-husband, he said he would take, take the babies, but apparently the wife in this couple was the wealthy one, but he wanted her to pay child support, which she was like, hell no, I'm not paying you a dime. Um, so what, what the surrogate was told, when she, she did eventually give birth to the twins, it was a boy and a girl, she was told that the woman kept the little girl and gave the little boy up for adoption. But she doesn't know if that is in fact true, but that's what the, the Chinese mother told her she was going to do with the babies. Hmm. Where that's is evil, huh? Like, well, I mean, it really does show that people think of this as like owning or renting a body. Like that woman, woman really believed that she could make a decision about what was happening to and in the body of this other woman because she paid for it. Yeah. Well, one, one whistleblower in a San Diego clinic reached out to me and she finally quit her job because she was over just dealing with the Chinese couples that would come. And she was, she said they were the VIP clients. And I said, well, what does that mean? She said it meant they were just wealthy, wealthy. She said it was not uncommon for them to get three surrogates pregnant. And then once all the pregnancies were confirmed and they knew it was girls or boys or twins or whatever, they would ask two to terminate and because they would pick the one that they wanted to move forward on. And That's she did, terrifying. She and said, right. I thought I was going to work, you know, helping people have families. I thought I was doing something good. And she's like, I can't do this work anymore. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to me that people don't think there's anything ethically wrong with this. Um, I mean, I'm curious to know how many, how many surrogate births are there in the U S every year? I mean, how common is this practice for people, for Americans to hire surrogates? You know, that's, those are the kind of sticky details that are hard to track because, you know, like in California, a, a surrogate mother waives her maternal rights usually at the time she signs a contract when she's not even pregnant. So when that baby is born in a hospital in California, that surrogate mother's name isn't even on the birth certificate. It's just the intended parents' names, whether that be a man and a woman or two men or one man or, you know. So there's no way to go back to like birth records and, and track. Mm -hmm. um, there's no central data tracking service in the United States. All we know, we can just track the financials that it's a booming growth industry. Um, in, it's in the, you know, billions and billions of dollars and it's trending up and it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, Nick Jonas, who's a, you know, popular singer guy out here in the United, United States, you know, he and his wife are one of those couples who was very public about our careers are taken off. We don't have time for pregnancy. So we're just going to have a surrogate. So, you know, so, you know, we're becoming more accepting of versus the olden days, you just felt, had sympathy for the really nice couple who tried and wanted to have a baby so bad and they couldn't, you kind of went. And now we just got people unabashedly just saying, yeah, our careers are just taking off and, you know. It's, it's it wasn't really convenient. Yeah. Which, like, I don't know that it's ever really convenient to get pregnant and have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't oh. seem like a very convenient, it's not going to like perfectly fit. Like it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing as I understand. But back to the adoption model, you know, when a, when a woman decides to, you know, proceed with the pregnancy, knowing that she's going to give the baby up for adoption, you know, none of that severing of her rights happens until well after that child is born. You know, it's it's like a cooling off period. Are you sure you don't want to change your mind? Is this really what you want to do? You know, letting that woman, you know, I guess truly be in the driver's seat, even if it might be a horrible situation that she finds herself in. Um, you know, but like I said, in, in, in California and in most states, as they advance more progressive laws, you know, they make sure that that maternal right is severed as quickly as it can possibly be and well before that baby's even born. Wyoming recently changed their law to make it so that baby goes home with the, the purchasing parents' names on the birth certificate. And the argument was it's such an inconvenience to have to go through a legal adoption after the baby's born to get the surrogate mother's 
name removed from the birth certificate and our names put what it's and, and it's an extra expense you know mm. hassle for us it's so much better to get the baby and bring it home with the birth certificate that we want it to say you know that is more convenient yeah um and actually and Suzanne in the in the live chat just pointed out if you don't have time for pregnancy you don't have time for kids either well they outsource that you have the nannies yeah <laughs> and you kind of go why did you want children i don't know is it like a handbag it's an accessory that you can bring out when you want to go to the park on saturday and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it does seem like that. It's one of those things, as almost all reproductive technologies are, that's treated as though it's a kindness. Um, it's really about like helping women and these women who are so sad, who are des desperate to become mothers and are devastated and their lives are going to be over if they can't have babies. Um, but then we look at these kinds of situations and it's like, do you really want a baby? Do you really want a family? Because you don't seem to want to do any of the things that that entails. Yeah. And it's like the argument with the incels, you know, they can't find anybody to have sex with them. Or so we're all supposed to feel sorry for them and want to sleep with, you know, it's just like- Altruistic <laughs> sex. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. because I'm a nice person, I'm going to help you out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been about an hour, so I'll, I'll let, try to let you go soonish. Um, if anyone has any more questions for Jennifer, please put them in the live chat now before we log off. I mean, I had mentioned, I did want to talk to you a little bit about transhumanism. Um, and I guess I, that's a big question, but I'm curious to know if you think there's a connection between this situation, what we're talking about, these reproductive technologies, the way that we as a culture are approaching things like biology and nature and the human body and transhumanism. Yeah, and that is that sort of is the, a thread too that goes through the transgender debate, you know, that we can we can deny the body, we can augment the body, we can mold and manipulate and alter the body. I mean, transhumanism, you know, they take it to the, the really, really far extreme. You know, they don't want to ever die. They want to live forever. And and whether they live forever in in some kind of a you know up upgraded uploaded technological body or whether they live in some kind of virtual neural network out there in the cloud, you know, because they, they sort of, you know, for them, the last straw is, you know, overcoming dying, you know, right now we're just trying to overcome fertility so we can have a baby, you know, the transgender, we're running to overcome our biological sex. So a man can now become a woman, you know, and the transhumanists just want to overcome the body because they see the body as something that's, dying, getting old, aging, ill, broken, you know, whatever. So it is a, it's just a denial of biological realities and yeah. technology to solve our problems and save us. Well, and to sort of, I, I mean, I do see it as sort of approaching life as though we can pretend that we're not getting older and dying, you know, in terms of things like reproduction and fertility. I mean, the reality of life is that you don't have as much control over your body as you would like to. I mean, you can't make all these decisions as though, you know, this is what's convenient at this exact time. I mean, that's just not how nature works. Yeah. And I think we have, we've lost our ability to be, have some kind of humility because we almost have an arrogance because I want something. I deserve it. It's my right to become a boy or become a man or to have a baby with somebody else's body. You know, we, 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 we've lost our sense of, I guess, maybe even awe and wonder of, of how fragile and delicate our bodies are. Mm -hmm. um, on one hand, we're crazy about being healthy and don't get fat and exercise and take care of your body. But then the other, other hand, we chop it and we pump it and we destroy it and we mutilate it. It's like schizophrenic. Yeah. So I, I wonder what you what you think would be successful in terms of discouraging people. You said surrogacy is getting more and more popular. Um, it does seem like it's becoming more and more open. And I mean, anything that celebrities promote is going to get more popular. And that's what's happening. It's just becoming more and more normalized. 
Um, Kathleen in the live chat says, for example, do you feel like public shaming would have a better chance than legislation? Um, I'm a big fan of public shaming in, <laughs> in the appropriate manner. Like if I ever bumped into Elton John, I'd probably say, you paid how much for those babies? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Must be nice to be so rich that you can buy women. Those babies look expensive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, but I also think, especially in America, I don't know, I don't know about the whole world context. You know, we are a litigious country, and since we've been at this long enough, and we know that the, this is a train wreck for women's health, and we're starting to see more and more evidence that it's not so hot for children born this way too. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, it's kind of like what we did with you know smoking, right? Once we found out that it really was dangerous, the jig was up. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember riding in the car with my mother when we didn't even have seatbelts, you know, and we finally got seatbelts because people were crashing and dying. And we went, you know, if people just wore a seatbelt, you know, deaths will plummet. So I'm forever optimistic that education works. It's public shaming, yes, when appropriate. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, and the facts, I mean, the facts are there. You can't deny them. But people go, but I was nice to my surrogate. I didn't treat her like that. I didn't tell her she had to do X, Y, and Z. Like, yeah, but you still risked her life. You know? Yeah. Well, uh, this conversation has been very enlightening. Um, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I really appreciate your work. As always, it was great to talk with you again. Yeah, and you're all in the chat room. Throw a little tip in the tip jar. <laughs> Thank you. <All> right. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. For those who aren't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye.